The second phylum that I'd like to cover today is the mollusca, the mollusks. And uh, this is one of my favorite phyla simply because uh, the basic form of a mollusk, the basic ancestral form of mollusk, has been so dramatically modified in some of its descendants in very unexpected and interesting ways. The mollusk body form um, looks perhaps, or was perhaps originally something like this uh, whelk down here, but it's become so modified in some other forms of mollusks that you really wouldn't recognize them as being kin at all. And in many cases, uh, some of these organisms were not recognized as being even remotely uh, closely related to one another for a very long time. Finally, uh, people noticed that there are similarities in the larval form of many of these organisms that suggested that they were actually one another's closest relatives. The mollusks are tremendously diverse. The only phylum that is more diverse than the mollusks is the arthropods, uh, which we'll be talking about uh, for Friday's lecture. They can be remarkably small. There are some bivalves or relatives of clams and mussels that are actually microscopic. And then there is the largest invertebrate on Earth, the giant squid, Archituthis, which can weigh something like 2,000 pounds. Fundamentally, the body plan of a mollusk is bilaterally symmetrical, though if you look at organisms like snails, for example, you'll realize that secondarily it has become asymmetrical. However, most of the structures within even uh, these gastropods, snails with these uh, asymmetrically coiled shells, uh, most of the features are still bilaterally symmetrical and paired. The fundamental body form of a mollusk and the ancestral body form of a mollusk probably looks something like this. There are a few features that you should know about the basic mollusk body plan, and you should know how they've been modified in different groups of mollusks that are extant today. The first feature I'd like to point out is this layer of tissue that covers the dorsal side of a mollusk, and this is called the mantle tissue. If you imagine that uh, you had a cape growing out of your back and you wrapped it around your sides, kind of over your head, almost like a Dracula cape, that's where the mantle is found on a mollusk. It's attached to the back, but often it curves down so that it covers the entire organism. Some organisms breathe through this tissue, in particular some gastropods, which is a group of mollusks we'll be talking about in a minute. There are many mollusks that live underwater, and their gills are usually extensions of the mantle tissue. So they're these very frilly or uh, laminate, uh, that is sheet-like structures that have a very large surface area that's used for respiration. Perhaps most importantly though, the mantle tissue secretes the shell, which is a feature that's very important for many, although not all, mollusks. Seashells are mollusk shells. These are shells made mostly of calcium carbonate uh, that come in a very wide variety of shapes and sizes. They usually serve, or almost always serve, to form a protective layer for a mollusk, but they can be used for other functions as well. I'm not going to get into it exactly, but uh, there are mollusks that use these shells to dig um, or drill even through solid wood. You're most familiar with these shells in the form of the snail shell, probably, because um, this is also, snails are also mollusks. And while you see many shells in this sort of paired um, bivalve or two-halved uh, shape, you'll notice that there are other shells that have this spiral form, and that's similar to the shell of a snail. The second basic mollusk feature is a muscular foot, and that's what's shown down here. Mollusks typically use, um, use this, this foot to glide across a substrate. Uh, often the substrate has been 
um, lubricated with mucus from that foot, but then muscular contractions that move backward across the foot are what push, for example, a snail forward across a surface. However, in many mollusks, the foot has been modified to serve other purposes. There are mollusks that use it as fins. Uh, the tentacles and arms of cephalopods like octopuses are derived from the foot. Uh, there are a number of mollusks that use that foot as a suction cup, and some bivalves uh, can inflate it as though it was some kind of anchor that they put down into the sand. On the inside of a mollusk, uh, you have a, <clears throat> a circulatory system um, that is somewhat rudimentary in that it is an open circulatory system. That is, there is a pulsatile vessel called the heart that propels a circulatory fluid through the body, but mostly that fluid is not moving through closed canals. It's moving through open spaces that are called sinuses. So instead of moving at high pressure, it's just sort of washing around organs and tissues. Uh, it moves relatively slowly, um, bathing all the tissues as it passes very slowly past them. The circulatory fluid in a mollusk is not called blood, it's called hemolymph. But hemolymph is a fluid that basically plays the same role uh, as that blood does in vertebrates. Like our blood, the hemolymph of a mollusk contains a pigment that binds oxygen. Um, in the mollusks, this uh, oxygen binding pigment is called hemocyanin. Uh, interestingly, it's also brightly colored, um, although it is chemically quite different than hemoglobin. Another thing that you see in the mollusks for the first time in this phyla that we've been talking about is a complete gut. That is, food comes in the mouth and out an anus. Um, this is a more efficient system than the incomplete gut that we've seen so far. In particular, what you can do if you have a gut where food starts at one end and travels only toward the other end, is that you can have different regions of the gut that are specialized to do different things. Um, you know that the food is going to pass first through one particular part of the gut, and so that gut can become adapted to take uh, food that is relatively large particles and break it down into smaller pieces. Then you can have another region of the gut that uh, breaks those down at the molecular level and another part of the gut that, say, absorbs nutrients that are released from your food. In an incomplete gut, where there's only one opening, all the regions of the digestive system have to be adapted to carry out all of those tasks. And again, we're getting into the problem of the spork. Um, one structure that tries to do many things is not going to do any of them as well as a structure, as three different structures that are specialized to do a single task each. This basic body form has become dramatically modified in the mollusks that we see today. There are animals called bivalves, those are the things like clams, scallops, mussels, that have this body form. Um, where, where they are almost entirely enclosed within the shell, and you see perhaps only a little bit of mantle tissue and a foot sticking out. There are the gastropods, the snails that we see on land, the slugs that we see on land and in the water. Um, these have the, the shell modified into a spiral shape, and the land gastropods in particular have a modified way of breathing that allows them to survive in the open air. In the cephalopods, the ancestral form has been perhaps most radically uh, modified. You have tentacles at one end. You have um, an, a, usually a shell that is reduced or completely absent. And you have an extremely different lifestyle than you see in any of the other mollusks. While you don't need to know the names of these different groups within the mollusks, it might be helpful for you to jot them down. Um, you only need to do this if it helps you remember which kind of organisms are which. The first group I'd like to talk about is what's called the gastropods. These are the familiar land snails and slugs, as well as the perhaps less familiar 
um, water or sorry aquatic snails and sea slugs. There are also a lot of other organisms in this group, whelks, conches, periwinkles, nudibranchs, sea hares, a vast variety of different kinds of organisms. This is the most diverse group of mollusks, which you should remember is a very diverse phylum to begin with. There are about 70,000 species of gastropods. Here are some uh, examples of what they look like. This is not a bivalve. It is, in fact, a uh, gastropod. Uh, some of them don't have shells, like this sea hare. Uh, the sea hare is one of the, the mollusks that I'm most fond of because I got to care for one for a number of years. Um, it was part of a collection of, of invertebrates that I had while I was teaching zoology. And they're actually really kind of charming animals in their, their slow, soft, fubsy kind of way. Their cousins, the nudibranchs, are elaborate and beautifully colored. Um, there's a gigantic variety of these animals to be found in the ocean. Um, but the ones I want to talk about first are what are called the pulmonate gastropods. These are gastropods that have managed to come out on land. And you remember that um, coming out on land is something that's really difficult for an organism to do. We haven't seen uh, really any truly terrestrial animals up to this point. Um, being out of the water is an extremely hostile place to be because you and all other animals are mostly made up of water. And keeping yourself from drying out on land is a serious challenge, particularly if you're going to try to reproduce out of the water. One of the adaptations that the pulmonate gastropods like this snail have evolved is that they've come to use the mantle cavity in a very different way than their ancestors did. Rather than it just being an open cavity that houses gills, the entire inside of the mantle cavity has become vascularized. That is, it contains blood vessels. And it's just like your lungs, um, the blood vessels close to the surface are able to exchange gas with the outside air. Here's what that structure looks like. This is the mantle cavity, and there are blood vessels that run all through it uh, and are capable of passing gas back and forth with the air that's inside that cavity. There's a small opening from the inside of the mantle cavity to the outside. It's called a pneumostome, and you can see it here on the side of this animal, which is a giant banana slug, one of the only gastropods that's big enough for you to easily see this structure. This, by the way, is a, a structure that you'll see over and over again, used for gas exchange in all kinds of organisms, including plants as well as animals. You've got a lot of surface area inside the organism that's being used for gas exchange, but that chamber inside the organism with all the surface area uh, has a very small opening to the outside. That's like the stomata that you've already seen in the plants, and the point of that is that allows the organism to expose lots of surface area to the air without losing lots of water. The next group of mollusks that you should be aware of is what's called the bivalves. And these are the, the mollusks that are most likely to end up on your dinner plate. They're oysters, scallops, mussels, clams, and a large variety of other two-shelled organisms. So these are the uh, mollusks where there are two mirror image halves to the shell. And this group is extraordinarily modified from the ancestral mollusk form. They can be huge, like this giant clam. It can be a meter across. They can be tiny. Some of the mollusks are microscopic. But they all have this basic same body shape. It's kind of difficult to recognize the ways in which these body structures are homologous to the body structure that we've seen on the snail because they're so dramatically modified and rearranged. For one thing, there's no head in a bivalve. Um, there is no central place where the nervous system is aggregated or concentrated. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it really hard to recognize them. This is, in fact, the um, anterior end up here and the posterior end down here. Um, or sort of over in this axis over here. Um, but it's really difficult to see that on a mollusk, or sorry, on a bivalve, something like to say this muscle. 
They do have a complete digestive tract. There's a mouth over at this end and an anus here, um, but they feed in a radically different way than snails and slugs do. If you cut sideways through a muscle, what you see is a structure that looks something like this. The mantle cavity is highly enlarged in these animals. Hanging down from the mantle cavity are these very filmy uh, sheets of tissue called tinidia, and again, those are gills. Ancestrally in the mollusks, these are used for respiration. But in most bivalves, these are used for feeding as well. There's a siphon back here, a, a tube um, called the incurrent siphon. And the opening here is the incurrent aperture. Water is shuttled into the body um, through that opening, and it moves over the gills before going into another chamber that leads back out of the body of the muscle again. Um, as it passes over this, um, the tinidia, the water may carry food particles. Um, these food particles are, get trapped in the gills. This is how, uh, this, this graphic shows how the gills have become enlarged over evolutionary time. Uh, again, ancestrally had this very large visceral mass in the center of the body. It became compressed laterally, as is shown here. And then you get the gills not only lengthening, but folding into a W shape to massively increase the surface area they present to the water. <clears throat> they have cilia that trap food particles. And then the food particles are passed to the edge of the gill or the tinidium. Um, from there, those food particles are passed in what becomes a bolus of mucus to the mouth. And so a muscle is just sort of constantly taking in small particles and shuttling them to its mouth. Often there are uh, tubes of flesh that's part of the mantle tissue that extend out of the shells, and those help direct water in, um, and they help direct water out. In many bivalves, like this gooey duck, which I think looks really disturbing, uh, the siphons are extremely long, longer than the rest of the body of the animal. And this is helpful for animals like this because they hide by burying themselves very deep in the mud so that only the siphons are poking out. This keeps them protected and secure against waves and currents, uh, but they're still able to get their siphon out of the mud in order to feed. My favorite group of the mollusks, and one of my favorite groups of organisms overall, um, is the cephalopods. And this is because more than pretty much any other group of animals, the cephalopods are bringing the weird. They have a remarkable set of very strange adaptations. Um, they are um, extremely unusual organisms and radically different in many ways than any of the other mollusks. In this group uh, are basically all the animals with tentacles, octopuses, squid, nautilus, and cuttlefish. Um, they can be, or some of them are rather, the largest animals and the largest predators among the invertebrates. All of them are predators, by the way. They are very active and they have excellent sensory systems, which is one of the things that you typically see among predatory animals. Their form is, can be relatively diverse. The nautilus really doesn't look anything like the octopus. Uh, cuttlefish look different still. Um, some of them can look charming. Some of them can look like nothing that you would ever want to meet in a dark alley. But they all share certain traits in common. In all of the cephalopods, the muscular foot has been elaborated into a set of tentacles, maybe as few as eight. Um, some of the nautilus have uh, dozens of tentacles. Often these have suckers on them. These are the uh, uh, tentacles of an octopus, which I can uh, say from personal experience, when they get a hold of you, it's difficult to make the octopus let go. Um, sometimes those suckers have hooks instead. So for example, a giant squid does not merely stick itself to you with a suction cup that actually hook into your flesh. Many octopuses are venomous, 
And in some of them, the venom is so dangerous that it can kill an adult human being. The blue ringed octopus, which is shown here, is a denizen of Australia, of course, because Australia has all the organisms that can kill you. Um, and its venom is so potent that it doesn't just have to, it, it can uh, immobilize prey not merely by biting it, but by actually just squirting out a little bit of venom into the water and then using a puff of water to send that venom into the hiding place that's occupied by a fish. That venom just floating in the water can be enough to stun the fish, at which point the octopus reaches in a tentacle, pulls the fish out of its hiding place like it's whole, and eats it. One of the very interesting ways in which the cephalopods are modified uh, from the ancestral mollusk is for uh, locomotion. The mantle cavity, again, that's the, the cavity that houses the gills, uh, the mantle cavity in the cephalopods is very muscular. And this is useful for them because it allows them to pull a lot of water through and push it out again, which is important if you're going to be active. You need to be um, performing a lot of gas exchange. That means that you need to have a high rate of water movement over your gills. But uh, the cephalopods have figured out how to use this flow of water in another way. Um, as you see in this octopus, the mantle tissue can be modified into a funnel or a tube that looks kind of like the siphon of a bivalve. But when the mantle cavity um, constricts itself very forcefully, that pushes a stream of water out of the funnel that allows an animal like an octopus to move itself by jet propulsion. And octopus and squid can move very, very rapidly by this method. In fact, some squid are able to move so rapidly that if they unfold the fins on their bodies as they reach top speed, they can actually angle up, come shooting out of the water, and fly for dozens of meters across the surface of the water after the manner of a flying fish. As I just mentioned, the mantle cavity has to be ventilated actively in order to uh, supply enough oxygen to keep this very, these very active animals running. For functional purposes, cephalopods have evolved a circulatory system that is closed. That is, the uh, circulatory fluid runs through vessels that are relatively narrow. Um, this allows them to maintain a circulatory system that runs at a much higher pressure, and that's useful because it delivers oxygen to the tissues more rapidly. There are certainly no invertebrates that are as intelligent as some cephalopods. Um, they've tested the, the intelligence of octopuses in a number of different ways. They are certainly capable of solving very interesting puzzles. Uh, there was just a, a news article the other week about an octopus by the name of Inky who figured out how, not only figured out how to escape from a sealed aquarium in a zoo in Australia, but then found a drainage pipe that led to the outside world uh, from which Inky the octopus dropped into the ocean and made his way to freedom. The cephalopod eye in particular is extremely sophisticated. It is formed in a way that is very similar to the vertebrate eye, the camera type eye, that we use to see. Um, and there's a wonderful evolutionary, uh, there's a wonderful set of evolutionary transitions among mollusk eyes, from eyes that are extremely simple to basically the first step toward an eye that can see in a particular direction, to now an eye that can see uh, blurry images, to the octopus eye over here, uh, or the squid eye, that can um, form very clear, sharp images. In fact, uh, octopuses are very visual hunters. If their ability to have suction cups on their tentacles and to solve puzzles and to spew out poison weren't enough, uh, cephalopods can change their appearance extremely dramatically. Um, the way that they do this is that they have tiny, sacs of pigment all over their bodies. These are individual cells, they're called chromatophores, and they're muscles around every one of these dots. When the cephalopod, in this case an octopus, 
stretches out that dot, it covers a large area and the surface of the animal looks dark. When it allows that um, little sac of pigment to constrict, it looks very small and the, uh, the um, octopus looks pale in color. The nifty thing about these is um, not only are there chromatophores of lots of different colors um, so that the cephalopod can take on just about any color it wants to, but the muscles are under nervous system control so that the um, octopus can very deliberately change its color pattern in a fraction of a second. They are smart enough and they have good enough visual systems that they can rapidly change their color to match just about any background. Um, in some of, the, uh, some of the cephalopods, like say the cuttlefish, that actually have social interactions with one another, Cuttlefish actually use their color patterns to send messages to one another. They basically display a message on their body using chromatophores. They can actually send messages uh, to one cuttlefish using one side of their body and at the same time be sending messages um, to another cuttlefish with the other side of their body. And that's a pretty neat trick if you can do it.